There's a few things Canadians can bet on. Want to bet that even though summer's over, for sports fans, the temperature's rising. Bet on Saturdays being spent in the yard, and Sundays will huddle with friends. You can bet camp will be in session. The numbers, magic. And inches, they'll be huge. Know what else you can bet on? Canada Sportsbook. Sports interaction. Made for Canadians by Canadians. You know how we like to bet and what we like to bet on. Sports interaction. Want to bet? Hello and welcome to another episode of Toronto Till I Die. I'm your co-host, Mike Newell. This is normally the Toronto FC show for Toronto FC fans, but we're going to take a small divergence because there is this little thing called the World Cup that might be happening in the next uh, couple of weeks. So we're all going in on the Canadian men's national team. Uh, first game in nine days, guys. Uh, so really excited uh, to be on board with that. So this week we're talking about obviously yesterday's roster announcement. Um, who's representing Canada? How close were our picks? We did a, uh, a roster drop a few weeks ago. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, also, we'll talk about the friendly coming up this week against Japan. And yes, it is still MLS silly season. So we do need to talk a little M MLS and TFC roster moves um, and maybe potentially a sign of bigger things to come. Jam-packed show. Uh, so let's get right into it with my co-hosts, Mike Singh and Jeffrey P. Nasker. Gentlemen, um, how did you enjoy roster drop day? How was uh, that for you guys? Uh, before we... Before we dive in, Mike, very professional, picking me up there. I was supposed to run the our intro there right after. I, I, the, I, gotcha. I, I, yeah, I got yeah. you, bro. Got you, whatever. Right here. Yeah, 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 right yeah. In. <laughs> all right, it's all right. First time at this. We got a couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the cans, yeah, we'll, we'll, so. we'll explain mm -hmm. what we'll, we'll explain this uh, this the start in a few minutes. <laughs> we'll we'll smooth this out though. But Mike's got plans, weekend, man. Jeff, how was your uh, weekend? I don't I don't even remember it because yesterday was just such a such emotion packed, man. Like. Uh, you saw it all over the interwebs. You saw it on the bird app, you know, people, uh, it's starting to feel real for them. You know, Mike, I know you expressed a certain, uh, begrudgment at the rollout of promotions. Uh, I wonder if your opinions changed because that seems to be all we're seeing now. I mean, every Canadian brand has crawled out of the woodwork with ads that look like they shot a while ago and, and put quite a bit of money into. So, I mean, it's all changed. Uh, you know, we're here. It's yeah, happening. It, it's weird because, uh, like, uh, first of all, I had a great weekend, uh, but was just getting ready for Sunday and watching the roster drop, which was just the exciting <laughs> part, obviously. I got, I got dressed um, on Friday and, and exactly, took my spot on the couch. It. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we're diehards, right? So we expect, you know, people to be on board for the World Cup months in advance. But obviously, mm -hmm. with the general populace, this is the time that they're going to be excited um, about it as it's about to come around. So yeah, you're right. Every brand you know, in the country seems to be jumping yeah. on the national team train, which frankly, if it means more money for the program, bring it up, bring it on, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Chris Fung is a bit disappointed. This isn't a Mikey Singh musing solo show again. Uh, Chris, you're aware I that too, I was on honestly, that. Chris. You're aware I that am. I was on that show for like the lion's share of it, right? Like my internet wasn't that bad. So I appreciate that Chris has ignored my contributions to that, to that episode. <laughs> they only gave uh, me 10 minutes. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bell was like, nah, man, 10 minutes and that's it. Man, it, that, that 10 minutes was excruciating in Jeff years, man. It felt like 10 years because uh, I was, I, I was very sure it was upset about it. Well, for listeners too. Yeah. But, uh, ow, but, yeah. ow. Yeah. Ouch, Mikey, how was your week um, lots of sports as usual. I mean, every time you talk to me, it's just sports, sports, sports. UFC fight was was crazy, a crazy UFC card. I like watching a bunch of different sports, obviously. Raptors, Leafs, not a good weekend for our Raptors. No. Um, no. And then Sunday, I need to get your guys' thoughts on this before we dive into some you know more relevant stuff. Cristiano mm -hmm. Ronaldo. Oh. Right, I'm, yeah. The world has seen this. Mike, I see your yeah. immediate reaction there. I know you're a Manchester United fan. I know you're not a Cristiano Ronaldo fan. Just your thoughts on his decision, particularly the timing of his decision to come out and essentially trash Manchester United. What did oh, you make it, of it? Uh, that, that was super coming. trash. It was coming. Like you know what yeah. I mean. Like it. Like it. It happened, and I was not surprised. Like this no, I, I don't think anybody was surprised. No, nah, it may, this was Manchester. Coming. Yeah, the club is going to feign surprise, but they weren't surprised either. You know what I mean? Like it's that's just the way it is. Well, I, I know, think for me, it's like you you brought him back 
and you knew you weren't in a place to really have him back, right? And look, hmm. set aside the the footballing issues, there are real life issues um, and reasons why he probably should not be back at Manchester United. But the fact that, you know, you brought somebody who just did not fit what you were trying to do either under the old manager, under the new manager, under the weird temporary manager, it doesn't matter. He doesn't fit anymore. And he's, look, he's going to go down as maybe the greatest footballer of all time. No <laughs> one's going to deny his footballing skill. But man, uh, it just, I mean, okay, you want out. <laughs> that, that's I mean, he's, do, he's out. Guess. Yeah, he's like, out. I mean, like, like, how how is he ever wearing a Man United shirt again? Uh, and considering he had, can, can, well, I mean, they do a lot of hand waving when it comes to Cristiano Ronaldo, and that's to be expected. He is a club legend. But like, listen, man, like, you know, you, I think your co-host Sarah said it best on Room Four Four Two today. Like, you can't say you love the club and then cite let light them on fire in a sycophant interview with Pierce Morgan of all people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like those are two well, polar diametric opposites. And, and you guys will find you this know, interesting. Mm. Sorry, you guys will find this really interesting. And this is something that I related it to just based on my time covering Toronto FC. Mm. There are times where Josie Altador, absolute club legend, right? Beloved mm -hmm. by the fan base. Um, towards the end of his career, obviously his play, the Toronto FC career, his play started to decline a little bit, but he would come out and randomly pick his moments to essentially bash the club, right? Yep. Where he, one that stood out to me was ahead of the 2019 season. Uh, he bashed the way Toronto FC handled Michael Bradley's injury, right? Yep. Yeah. We all and, remember, yeah. Okay. At the one, t one hand, you're bashing the club. But at the same time, Josie's point was, I love this club so much that I want to see this club do better, right? Yeah. I believe that this club can do better. And I think we should raise the standard and elevate the standard of this club. But the difference that between what Josie Altador did. Here it comes, yeah. By the way, that, that got a lot of respect from the fan base, that moment in particular when Josie did that. But the difference between what Josie Altador did and what Cristiano Ronaldo is now doing for Manchester United is... Josie was still invested in Toronto FC in 2019. Mm -hmm. Like he was still wanted to put on a TFC shirt and go out there and perform for the club. Cristiano Ronaldo wants nothing to do with Manchester United at this point. He, uh, so no. for me, if, if this was an interview that came out two years after the fact, um, I might look at this interview in a different light. But to yeah. me, this, this, this interview has too much of an agenda. Whereas such you know, an agenda, Josie, I think Josie was such actually an doing it for the love of the club. No, and he's um, look, he's had an agenda. Either. Yeah, he's had an agenda at Manchester United since the day he signed, right? Like it, it's mm -hmm. not it. Anybody who was paying attention to this knew what was going to happen when, as soon as the Man City rumors came out. And I'm sorry, not to spend all our time on a Toronto FC podcast talking about Cristiano Ronaldo, but um, <laughs> never, you know, never, I, never. But, uh, exactly. But as you know, yeah. once the Man City rumors came out it was clear that he was, you know, there was an angle there. You know, we, we were talking about Rio Ferdinand getting on the phone and Sir Alex getting on the phone and Ryan Giggs getting on the phone and yeah. trying to convince him to not sign at City. The, that's when I knew there was going to be problems, right? Because there's too <laughs> many guys at Manchester United, too many club legends hanging around, giving opinions, and not really helping the club move forward. Now, there are people within the club that are definitely have a... I would say an old school mentality on modern football, and it is going to hurt this club long term unless they really start to change the way they do things. But people are too stuck on the United way. Too many people are stuck on the Sir Alex Ferguson years. And let's not forget, although Sir Alex mm -hmm. left with a title, he left the club in not a great space in terms sure. of you know, the players that he left behind, um, you know, kind of kind of left David Moyes with the bag, you know. Um, yep. So from that perspective, it, just as somebody who has followed Manchester United his entire life um, and, and, you know, for most of him, my life only knew the good times and only knew one manager that ran a, with a club a certain way. But realizing that the world has moved on from that, Manchester United are still stuck. And and they still and they can't get themselves out of it. And this is just another example of that. Sure, sure. I I would add, of course, you know, 
uh, Sir Alex is pretty famous for popular, uh, pop popularizing the old adage, you know, once a player uh, thinks he's too big for the club, the only conversation is goodbye. So, um, and then just to add uh, fuel to the fire, you know, Rio Ferdinand has come out publicly and said Ronaldo should no longer be at Man United. Yeah, and he can't there's no going anymore. back. Where, where in, where no in the shirt back. anymore. There's no going back. I mean, no this is... Back, but you know, Rio sometimes, this is, man. Is, there's still mm. games to be played before the January transfer window. So yeah, yeah. it's, it's going to circle back. And just, it's... Listen, but there's time now between no games and the World Cup. We know the conversation is just going to be about Ronaldo, Ronaldo, Ronaldo. It's mm-hmm. so predictable. It's so calculated. This is Cristiano Ronaldo to a T. But well, yeah, yeah. On, before we do, uh, just quickly, <laughs> we do have a... I was trying. I was trying with your with your comment, buddy, but but I couldn't find a way to get it in there. Uh, Christopher <laughs> said that Man U's in the same place as Arsenal was when we had... Uh, Ozil and uh, Obama Yang. Uh, I don't think Mesut Ozil and uh, Pierre Emerick Obama Yang command the same kind of respect and uh, and the same attention as a certain CR7. So uh, this is an entirely different animal. This is a club legend returning for a victory lap um, and just basically having try, trying to have his way with this situation. You know, he's basically told Man U that he doesn't need their help moving clubs. So we'll see. He's now betting on himself to 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 get another deal for himself because the club isn't going to do much to help him unless it's to absolutely get him out the door. So, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's a really interesting situation. Yeah, I chalk just... it up to, yeah. I, I mean, I chalk it up to a November World Cup. You know, this wouldn't have happened uh, if it was in the, the regular cycle. But you know, the, we're sort of unstuck in the in the standard way things are going. So leave it to a player like CR seven. You know, with a with an ego like like his to to try and maximize the peculiarities of this weirdo World Cup cycle, get what he wants, you know, a uh, couple months from you from a transfer window where he wanted to move and they couldn't make it happen. Yeah, let's kill this topic by just saying, no, TFC fans, we're not using a three, third DP spot out of Christian mm. Ronaldo, so let's no. just kill no. that. Uh, no, I'd rather have that, Joseph that Martinez. Up. I'd rather have Soteldo back, to be completely yeah. honest with you. So, um, yeah. so before we get into the, the show with proper, a couple of special announcements. Uh, so that mm. you're aware of what's going on with the show in the next couple of weeks. Um, one, we're going to be moving to twice a week starting next week. So more of us uh, in your TV screens and on, in your ear holes um, during Canada's World Cup run. Uh, so we're going to be on our normal Mondays, uh, 3, 4 o'clock start. Uh, and then we're going to also add a Thursday evening show. Uh, so that is going to be fun sort of recapping some World Cup stuff. And obviously Toronto till I die after dark. Exactly. Nice. And uh, looking yeah. at uh, Canada's run during the World Cup. So look for that starting next week. Uh, those For those of you who watch on YouTube, uh, we are now going to actually have the show on our own YouTube channel. I think you're used to going to Homestand Sports. Um, so now it will be Toronto till I dies YouTube channel. So just search for us on YouTube, do the, the, the liking and the subscribing, hit the bell for notifications. We're basically YouTubers now. Uh, okay. Um, no, but that chat. So yeah, there it is. Anybody wants yep. to go head over. There we're actually going to be stopping, uh, streaming on homestand. Uh, and we're going to be moving over, like Mike said, just to that channel solely. So make sure you guys, uh, Head over to that one and subscribe to it. Thanks, it Rachel. Hey, hey, always a, icon. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Rachel. Sweet. Um, and then, of course, you saw uh, a different opening uh, than you probably are used to seeing uh, with us. Uh, we are excited to announce that we have partnered with Sport Interaction, Canada's sports book, uh, for the group stage of the World Cup. So for the next couple of weeks, we'll be working uh, with Sport Interaction. We will be running ads uh, prior to the show. Uh, you know, we do a lot of work here to to make the pod happen. So, uh, you know, we just want to make sure that uh, we get a little cash in there. But uh, we appreciate uh, Sport Interaction for uh, coming on board. Uh, we're going to also be doing a new segment uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks where we're just going to be picking some of our favorite uh, Team Canada prop bets. Um, so Love you're going to see bets. that. We're starting mm-hmm. that a little later. Some mm-hmm. of them are really fun. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah, and I'm not a like I'm not a better um, in in sort of my own personal life, but uh, I took a look at some of these and they were actually kind of cool. Uh, so we have one this week that we'll uh, talk through and uh, sort of give our thoughts on that. So stay tuned. Uh, but with that said, um, let's mm. move into 
Let's uh, go. The men's national team roster announcement. Obviously, yesterday, John Herdman officially announced his 26 uh, player roster. Uh, you know, I was on the Tunnel Club yesterday with Sean. And we talked about the fact that before we got into the who deserved to make it, you know, who got quote unquote slighted, though I don't think we can really say anybody got really got slighted. Um, mm -hmm. th just 26 people that get to write their names into Canadian sport folklore forever. Um, and that is an incredibly powerful sort of narrative. And yesterday I, I felt you know, looking at people's tweets and seeing sort of online reaction and not just from fans, but from, you know, sport professionals in this country, whether yeah. they be journalists, whether they be people who used to play the game, there was just a collective joy for a lot of the players that made yeah. it in. And almost every single one of the players that made the national team for this World Cup has some kind of really unique story that just draws you to them. Um, and that was a um, that was just a, an amazing, an amazing hour of television to watch. Yeah, I, I thought TSN did a great job. Yeah, yeah, they did a fantastic job. job. Um, mm -hmm. And that was that was something that stuck with me. I just in, before we get into sort of breaking down the roster itself, just your guys' reaction to the sort of just the moment of seeing the the players be announced. Look at that smile on his face. I'm smiling, right? I'm smiling because there have been over this journey, and we call it a journey because this has literally been going back mm -hmm. for years now. Uh, when this yeah. World Cup qualif qualification bid began, and I'll even date date back to even pre pandemic, uh, before honestly, 2019 Canada US break. versus Canada, yeah, yeah, right. And there's been mm -hmm. over this journey, there's been s certain milestones you hit where you take a step back and you realize how significant this was. Obviously the big one was March at BMO field in the snow against Jamaica, Canada officially mm -hmm. booking its ticket. But then you think back to the ice tech and then you think back to the U S men's national team win in Hamilton, Ontario, there are certain things that certain milestones that you hit that make you really appreciate and makes this journey start to feel sort of, sort of real. And I think yep. yesterday, the, the roster announcement was another one of those milestones where it just, it gets you so hyped up for the world cup. Yep. Really well put. See, really well put. You're starting to see so many different people, casuals who are now starting to tune in and pay attention. And, and it is really starting to, to feel real. We're less than a week away and, you know, it really is starting to feel like that. So, uh, yeah, just it, it was it was really exciting. It was another exciting moment. One hundred percent. Yeah. And and I think for me, what I took out of this with these sort of great stories uh, of these players that have, have made it and, you know, they, they've now they're starting to become part of the Canadian sort of sport conversation. Right. You know, the mm -hmm. idea of a Joel Waterman, Alistair Johnson's journey, uh, Ishmael Kone literally becoming a professional, you know, early like later this year, right? Daniel mm -hmm. Henry's sort of sacrifice that he has to make. Like these, these things, these stories, these narratives that have now been written about these uh, about these gentlemen and their in their journeys, they are just incredible. And to me, yep. somebody who is a Canadian Premier League stand, right? Like Joel, like Joel Waterman, just to think about his journey, right? You sport player who before there was a Canadian Premier League would have probably just been out of the game or may have found a semi-pro sure. route or something like that. But that pretty much in terms of a national team perspective, like that ends your run. You're not going. And mm -hmm. for him to go through that path through the Canadian Premier League and then get a trial at Montreal and then get on the team and then start you know, getting minutes here, drip drab of minutes. And then sort of this ends up being kind of the breakout year where he gets consistent minutes um, and now finds himself on a world cup roster. And you could say, you know, okay, Daniil was hurt and he probably doesn't make it if Daniil doesn't get hurt. Sure. But to even be in the conversation yep. Yep. to yep. potentially be a replacement player at that, like that's incredible. The odds of that in Canadian soccer just the way things are set up right now are so low. Um, but now that we start to have these pathways, uh, you can start to see more of these stories and hopefully they just become more of a regular occurrence than sort of this unbelievable one-off thing. 
Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, just a quick tidbit yeah. on that. And what I want to mention is you mentioned people on the brink. Three players actually that John Herman mentioned yesterday in his in his media call that he was asked, you know, did you call players uh, that didn't make the team or did you call players that did make the team? Three players he mentioned that he didn't call, or did call to tell them that they didn't make the team were Jaden Nelson, Jacob Schaffelberg, and the third mm. was Charles Andreas Bram. Right. Wow. So just the fact that it's cool to see two, I mean, Schaffelberg's no longer, but two TFC products, let's call them, mm -hmm. um, be so close to making this national team, I think is is a testament. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to them. Now you mentioned Joel Waterman's story there, Mike, and I I may have to say his story, you're right. You can go through literally every single one of these Canadian yep. men's national team players and come up with such an amazing story for each one. Um, mm -hmm. Joel Water Waterman might be my favorite, but I'll ask you guys, what was your favorite story? Jeff, go ahead. What yeah. is your favorite story? Uh, I mean, for it's got to be Daniil uh, at this late moment uh, doing the unthinkable uh, and putting in that that kind of a selfless uh, 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 move to allow uh, another player to take his spot. But I'm leaning towards Liam Frazier's uh, <sighs> little little social media uh, moment capture because that was just so human. Um, and, uh, you know, wow, wow. So so the, like, I mean, I, I think they're both equal uh, for for various reasons. Uh, you know, you don't usually see a player's camp allow that kind of vulnerability uh, to be expressed in a public forum like that. And, uh, you know, Daniil, I mean, how much more can I say about it? It's 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 unbelievably classy move. Uh, you know, he it, it wasn't uh, I mean, Nathan saying he was surprised Liam Fraser made it, to be honest. Mike, I know you have some thoughts on that, Mikey Singh, because I think you've got some hot takes about Liam Fraser being a uh, a dark horse uh, super performance for for Canada. Um yeah, you know, it, 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 this is what you see. I, I know we've all we're all watching the uh, the Cansock documentary and it's uh, in its unfortunate home on YouTube as opposed to broadcast television. But, uh, you know, uh, you, every cheer ends with the Brotherhood chant. Right. It's it's drilled into these guys. And, and it's easy to say like that's that's it's easy to say Brotherhood and it's easy to use those sound bites in interviews. But you're seeing it writ large when it actually matters. You know, uh, Daniil's in an interesting situation. I know we all know that he had a 14 day window, which means he could have participated in the group stage. Uh, there are a lot of players, I would say nine out of 10 that take that ticket, uh, because you know, you're thinking about yourself in your own career. He wasn't, uh, you know, obviously he's still going to be on the plane to guitar and still work in some capacity. Um, that's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. You know? Yeah, it is. Um, for me, I think, yeah, obviously Liam Frazier's video, like, you know, yeah, Goosebumps. I cried. Of course, yeah. I cried. Yeah, of course. I mean, like just to see that. Yeah, to see that human emotion of, of somebody mm -hmm. who's worked so Wait, hard. Like you cried. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Like there were tears. <laughs> like I'm not. I'm not ashamed to say there were tears. Um, just to, just to see some of these. Well, just you think about it, right? Like we've been around TFC, all of us, for a while, right? So we mm -hmm. we we kind of, you know, we've been around. Do we? I've met Liam Frazier personally. Like. Mm -hmm. you know the path that he has taken to get here, right? And it has yep. not been a linear sort of easy path for him, right? He thought he would get a chance here. It didn't happen. He goes to Columbus. Maybe he gets a shot at Columbus. It doesn't happen there. He's got to bet on himself to go to Europe, play in the second division in Belgium, and maybe get a shot, right? And yep. the guy turns up for camps when called. He doesn't return down a call, and he's been rewarded. And, and I think that's, uh, th those are kind of the stories that um, I think really re are going to relate to obviously the, the hardcore people like us who, who watch this team and are involved in it day by day, but also those yep. who are just coming to know this team right now. I think that's going to be such a big part of the sort of story and journey of this national team is people 100%. getting to fall in love with these players. So like my personal favorite story is Alistair Johnson. Like I saw Alistair mm -hmm. Johnson in league one Ontario, right. Play for mm -hmm. in, in the, in the first couple yeah. of years. Right. Like, and, and I saw him at like Monarch park, like in a high school. Yeah, high school. Monarch park. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, I, 
Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, so, so, you know, though, from there, from there, the odds, right. To, to end up where he has to the point where he is undroppable. Like we said it yesterday yep. on the tunnel club. He is the one of the first players on the team sheet every 100%. single match. Yeah. And that is an incredible place for him to end up. And it just a testament to the, the drive and the hard work and sort of the unusual routes that ways and routes, I should say that, um, these players have to take to get to where they've gotten to. Yep. Yeah. I don't think Nathan's wrong. Like I was surprised to see Liam Frazier make it too. Um, I didn't have him on my 26 just because I had Daniil in the roster. But mm -hmm. then when you, you take Daniil out, obviously Scott Kennedy's not there. So Joe Waterman makes it. And then, yeah, it makes sense that Liam is that 26 guy. Yeah. Um, yep. I didn't have him just because he was left out of a lot of Canada camps down the stretch. No, that's fair. I thought he was, I that's thought fair. He, he was dropped from the side um, by Herman, but to be honest, I love I love the move. Um, not Me just too. from a personal standpoint, as like you, Mike, I've met Liam and I know what this means to Liam, but from a tactical perspective, I think he brings a certain element that this team may need to lean into, which is yeah. a obviously the fearlessness. Like you do not want it to go into a tackle with Liam Frazier. He is going three. He understands what it means to put that maple leaf on your chest or whatever badge it's playing. Honestly, that's just the way Liam 100%. plays. Mm -hmm. He is going to be tough in that midfield, but be his passing ability. Yeah. Those and line he, splitting passes. Unbelievable. We could use those. Yep. Yeah. Right. That one against Honduras, obviously everyone talks about it with stupid setting Jonathan stupid. David over the top, but he has that in, we've seen it for so long. If he has time on the ball, Liam Frazier can pick a very good pass. And I think that's what separates him actually from a guy like Sam Piet on the world stage. Um, mm -hmm. Sam Piet, I think you can get away with playing him against MLS caliber players or players around that area. But when you move up a level, uh, especially when you're going to go up against the Belgium and Croatia, you need guys who can keep the ball and guys who are capable of making, if you're not going to play with the ball, when you're in possession to, to make use of it. And Liam mm -hmm. Frazier has that ability, plus he has that, also ability to be really good defensively. So my hot take, I guess, per se, is I would start if we're not start Liam Frazier, but if you had to pick between Frazier and Piet, I would actually pick Liam Frazier here because I think he has that extra gear to him that I don't think Sam Piet necessarily has. You, you know what Sam Piet's floor is. I think Liam Frazier's ceiling would be higher. Uh, That's fair. Okay. Than Sam Piet. okay, so then uh, let, let's sort of transition to this. Like, uh, mm. obviously... You know, we're we're sort of saying maybe there might have been a surprise that Liam made it. Were there any other sort of omissions or admissions to this team that you found to be a bit of a surprise um, to this twenty six? I didn't really find a ton. Not I really. could I could make a, a justifiable case for just about everybody on the team mm -hmm. uh, that made it. Uh, did you uh, maybe outside of Liam because we kind of talked about him now? Is there anyone else that you're kind of like, hmm, interesting, or hmm, we didn't go with that person? The one guy I thought may have an inside track um, is Charles Andreas Brim. And yeah. I know the last time he was with the national team, which which was during that September window, to me, he didn't look very good. He wasn't really effective when he came on the pitch. And I thought mm -hmm. there was no chance that, you know, he would end up making this this team. But then over this last month and a half, he's been playing lights out. Yeah. He is in incredible form. And I know... And this is what made me second guess it when the U S men's national team dropped their roster and the way mm -hmm. that they picked their forwards, it was based off guys who were in form. So I thought maybe, maybe there was a chance that, uh, that Andreas Brim could, could slide in, but obviously that wasn't the case and I'm not losing sleep over that. that you, yeah. Yeah. I never want to pick our forwards the same way bear alter picks his because he yeah, doesn't know. Yeah, they don't know what number nine they have. They've got like 11,000 waiting in the wings that are all doing interesting stuff, but are probably un underqualified to lead the, ahead, uh, the U.S. attack. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the United States and how they picked their forwards because you were talking about players in form, but Ricardo Pepe's in form and he's not going. Um, yes. did, so you, just, did you read the article in The Athletic where they where Burhalter offered that the reason that uh, 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 my favorite uh, sergeant got the nod over Pepe was because uh, the Belgian league tends to be defense optional 
and and uh, uh, sergeant's form in the Champo, where there's a lot more defending and it's a lot more physical. Kind of, kind of took. I mean, it is rationalizing, like you know, picking from a bunch of bad apples, right? None of these guys have won the spot, so. Yeah, I mean, I'd much rather be in a position where it's like we've got our locked-in starters, and the question is, you know, will Carl, will Kyle Laren starter come off the bench? Then, you know, which one of our, you know, m- pretty underwhelming uh, U.S. forward pool is going to make the trip to Qatar, and 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 how and why have we made the decisions? But uh, Star, go ahead. Yeah. Man. yeah, I think you were going to say something. Uh, I was just going to say the other thing that I was questioning was whether, since this you. World Cup got expanded from 23 players to 26 players. I was wondering if John Herman might throw a guy like Daniel Jebison on the, mm. obviously he's injured, but just throw him on the roster or a guy like Collier show, throw him on the roster and just get them sort of acclimated a little bit more to, to the environment and maybe a little bit of selling uh, the men's national team to a dual nationals like them. Um, that was something I wonder, but obviously he decided not to go with that. Uh, interesting. Yeah. We'll hold on uh, analysis of that because we actually one of the burning questions actually relates to that. Oh, well, there you um, go. Mm-hmm. So somebody did ask us about that, um, and I actually have some thoughts on, on that as well. So we'll Sweet. hold on that uh, for now. Hold that thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going into a friendly against Japan on Thursday. Um, I would suspect that we'll see as close to the strongest starting eleven we'll get for the World Cup. So the question is, so, yeah. who is in that eleven for you guys in terms of Ooh. obviously let, let's let's count out a few people automatically. If Fonzie's healthy, he's in. Um, mm-hmm. Jonathan David's going to start. Milan Borian is going to be in goal. Aside from mm-hmm. that, and Stefan Ostakio will be in the midfield. Aside and Alistair Johnston. That, and, Alistair and the back Johnston. three is the back three. Yeah, you you think that's mm-hmm. pretty solid? Back four, I'll throw Adekubi in there too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. then you're going. Uh, with Doesn't leave a lot of Victoria, spots. Victoria Miller and Johnson as the three center backs for sure. And then if a, you look at, at the, that's actually my biggest concern with this men's national team roster is mm. behind Victoria Miller and Johnston. Uh, yeah. Very slim pickings at center back. I like Cornelius, where... man. I I like Cornelius. I think we're I think we're sleeping on him, but uh, sure, I, I feel you. Sure, but it's but definitely a level. drop off. Um, but to mm. the point where John Herman is contemplating the idea of perhaps having to play a Tiba Hutchinson at center back if uh, something does go wrong. So if you're in that position, it's not a great position to be in. But yes, sure. to sure. answer your question, Mike, those are my three center backs. I think we can all agree that if we're playing some sort of variation of like a 5-4-1 or a 5-3-2, the left wing back would be Sam Atakube. Um, He's been automatic, so I don't think there's any real debate there. This one is where there is debate. Um, the right wing back role. Yeah, I was about to ask. Mm-hmm. Right, there's two. There's two guys I think that are going for this spot, um, and that's Richie Larea mm-hmm. and Tejan Buchanan. There is ways that you can get all of those guys onto the pitch together. Um, maybe we do see it, but just for argument's sake, if you had to choose between. Richie Larea and Tejan Buchanan as your right wing back starting against Belgium game one. Who do you pick? Jeff, go ahead. It's I want to say Richie, but it's hard to make a case against Tejan. Uh, I'm still going to say Richie. I mean, if he can bring the kind of fire that he, that we see consistently from him, obviously against a side that's immeasurably uh, playing at a higher level. Uh, I like the chaos. I'm always going to vote chaos. That being said, uh, Tejan's a chaos merchant as well. Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, I, uh, I trust, I trust in, in, in the, in the John father, whatever, whatever he decides. I think okay <laughs> that's, a that. that's a cop. That's a cop. That is a cop. I'm, I'm, I mean, gonna, I'm going to, I'm going to say Richie because, uh, I think, you know, depending on the game state, Richie, you know, what we were all obvi- we're probably going to be in, in a position and nine times out of 10, we're probably going to be in a position where K- Tejon makes more sense coming off the bench uh, as a, as an impact sub than Richie does. So I say, start Richie if you have to leave Tejon on the bench, but I mean, why wouldn't you just move him up the field into a, into a right wing position? 
Yeah, my, my thoughts are the same. I think you start Richie. I think just for the simple fact, I think defensively he just gives you a little bit more um, assurance at, at the right wing back. Not to say that Tejon is not good at right wing back. I think he's grown a lot, um, especially mm -hmm. being at Club Bruges. But I think there is a way maybe you can actually get Tejon on the pitch yeah, um, as a starter. For sure. There, there um, is. There yeah. is. But I'm just saying for argument's sake. Like if yeah, you for argument's sake, I, I'm going Richie. I think I just mean, defensively he gives you a bit more. Yeah, for, for argument's sake. What would it do to Tejon if we put him out at right wing back and he gets absolutely shredded by Belgium in game okay, one? Does that but, destroy his confidence? Like, But hold on. Hold on. Mm -hmm. This is Tejon uh, Buchanan who has been playing mm -hmm. fullback for Club Brugge the entire season. Like, This is a guy who's Truth. been playing Champions League football, has been playing at a high level the entire season. Richie Loera hasn't been playing football for That's over fair. a month. He was not great down the stretch let's face it for toronto fc he dropped off mm -hmm. i know whenever richie puts on a, a canada shirt it's also something different like he takes his game to That's... a different level but if you're yeah. picking between the two 10 times out of 10 you're picking tejan buchanan tejan buchanan is just an absolute baller and he's you guys yeah. are not doing him justice defensively this guy is a workhorse defensively he's not easy to get around i, I no. don't think it's an Actually, I, I think it isn't easy. I think you choose Tejon ten times out of ten. That being okay. said, yeah, there I, there are ways that you can get both of them onto the pitch. Um, specifically, maybe John Herman decides not to go with two strikers up top. Well, that's right? that's my thing. Tejon like you probably yeah. drop yeah. Kyle Laren. I think you you may you may have and to drop Kyle. Laren. That's a guy who's not in form, so that would be yeah. exactly a, okay argument then. We can also discuss what Kyle Laren does in a Canada shirt and how clutch Kyle Laren yeah. is for Canada. And then maybe there's a maybe you want to throw Junior Hoylet into the side too. So I always yeah, just <laughs> can I just pause for a second that mm -hmm. we're in a generation where we're know, having a conversation a where this is an I know, actual problem I know. for Canada. What a time! What, what a time. time! What a time! Uh, what a time! But yeah, no, I, I think you're right, Mike. I, I think there's there are, that right wing back position then opens up so many possibilities of what you can do to, going forward. My question is, and, and I can come around on Tejon in a sense that from a counter-attacking perspective, uh, you, you have Tejon on that right. That's maybe the guy you want. But Richie's no slouch. In a no slouch. Either, right? No. I think Richie's a great option off the bench. I mm. I personally mm. believe that. Um I I go back and forth on this all the time, and ideally, I my guess, ideal yeah. starting eleven actually has both of them on the pitch. So there that, we go. Well, that was a trick question. Where it was I always was a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I um, think that's, that's where I was yeah. going, right? Like I think. Well, I mean, right it's based on the yeah, Kyle Aaron since, which is unfortunate. I I guess um, you know just to bring it back to the Japan friendly, this is what we should be looking at. You know what. The starting lineup is and whether Herdman and the brain trust are testing out a situation where maybe Laren doesn't start and we get both of them on the field uh, in the starting 11, uh, you know, trying out uh, different uh, different plans for the game states, because I think we're all going to agree the Japan game is going to be at a much higher tempo than the Bahrain game was. Uh, and, uh, you know, that suits us. But it may also undo us because, uh, you know, we haven't really been playing games at very high tempo for a while. So, yeah, I'm very I'm very interested in this in this final tune up game, uh, especially given, you know, the questions we've just raised over the last 10, 20 minutes, which are great problems to have. But there's still problems. And, uh, you know, this this World Cup is coming up quick. So it's best to have answers as opposed to, to more questions. So, yeah. So then I guess out of that Japan game, because remember Japan, their last game with a full sort of national squad, not sort of big squad guys and stuff like that, they beat the U.S. 2-0 quite handily. Quite um, handily, yeah. So what do we want is, or what should we hope to see out of uh, the friendly that will heighten our confidence uh, going into the first game against Belgium? Like what do you want to see or what, aside from a win, obviously, but mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. stylistically or play-wise, what would we what would we want to see that gives us the sort of ticks the boxes and say, yes, okay, we're ready for Belgium. Well, Japan's a tough team. Uh, Japan is a team that will work you to death, right? Yep. They are relentless um, up and down the park and they're a team. I don't think I would actually say Japan might be equivalent or even a little bit higher than Uruguay in terms of getting you ready for, for the world cup. I, I agree. This is, 
I think this is such a good friendly uh, by Canada. Knock on wood that nobody gets hurt, but this was such a good get by Canada right before the World Cup um, because it's a good stepping stone to the competition that you're going to face. So yep. if Canada, and this is what John Herman has come out and said, if Canada wants to play on the front foot, if they want to play with the ball, if they want to attack, attack, attack during this World Cup, then I want to see that during hmm. at, against a team like Japan who yeah. will not make it easy for Canada to do that because they're so good at capitalizing on mistakes and forcing yep. mistakes yep. out of you. So if Canada can hang and do that against Japan and create a lot of chances like they did against a team like Uruguay, which I think Canada actually outchance Uruguay in that match then I think that's a positive step but I know you did you don't want to hear a result Mike but I actually think that's also very important for Canada yeah me too no I think I think it is important I think a result is actually important I'm not saying I don't want to hear a result like I I I actually think a result would be important um just from a confidence perspective even if you come away with a nil nil or a one one draw I think it gives you some confidence that okay our defensive structures are about where we wanted to be attacking wise, we're able to, to create things. Um, and, and it gives you a measure of confidence. Now, obviously Belgium is another level of course, but mm. uh, I think going into that game, having that sort of in your belt um, and, and not either getting played off the park or, you know, end up sort of shooting yourself repeatedly in the own foot um, that would serve Canada really well going into Belgium. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think I think it's about tempo. Uh, as long as uh, Canada can dictate the tempo or at least hang with the tempo, uh, I'll be happy. But beyond that, yeah, it's about it's about results. And, it, and, and you know, uh, you've convinced me with the last little while. It's about figuring out the final sort of tactical adjustments that we need to take uh, with respect to this team and, and who's starting, who isn't. And, and, and that can only be decided when a ball is kicked in anger. So this is a, this is a really important turn up match. Yeah, when John Herman was he was pissed after the Uruguay game. I don't know if you guys caught that, but he was really upset that Canada didn't capitalize, and hmm. he essentially looked at it as as a learning lesson. But he told his team, he told the players, he wasn't happy because that game was in the balance. Yeah. So when you work so hard and you you manage to to gut out a game like that, you need to take advantage. So if Canada end up doing that that against Japan, they better take advantage because that'll that'll do wonders for their confidence. So, uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, such a good friendly Thursday morning, bright and early. Let's go. Mm-hmm. It's Let's go. Closer, man. Let's go. Let's it's go. incredible. Let's go. It's, it's an incredible time for Canadian soccer fans. So get ready. It's, it's, the, it's the last tune up before the, the, the games really begin. It's, it's incredible to think that the world cup starts in less than a week, um, with Qatar, Ecuador on Sunday. So, um, all right, boys, are you ready? We're, we're going to go into the new segment here. I'm um, really excited about this. Uh, it's TTID Best Bets brought to you by our new partners at Sport Interaction Canada Sportbook. Um, I'm actually stoked for this because, like I said, like I, I'm not a really a betting guy. So, Mike, I'm definitely going to be leaning on you a little bit um, in regards <laughs> to the, the prop bets and stuff. But I yep, found some yep, really interesting I, I, I found some interesting stuff in Sport Interaction's uh, website in terms of what they have for prop bets. So we'll take a look at one and kind of uh, sort of break it down for everybody. So uh, you want to bet? Uh, we, you can do it all at uh, Sports Interaction, Canada Sportbook. Every single World Cup game at your fingertips. Bet pregame, live in play, or one-on-one of our many Canada-specific prop bets. Made for Canadians by Canadians. Sport Interaction makes it easy to deposit, play, and cash out. Join now and see all sport betting has to offer. Uh, so head to bit.ly, T-T-I-D, pod. That is B-I-T dot L-Y slash T-T-I-D, P-O-D, uh, to play along. Uh, 19 plus, please play responsibly. Um, okay, so uh, what is T-T-I-D bets? Well, I just sort of mentioned it. Uh, we're heading into the Sport Interaction website. We're going to pick out some prop bets. Um, on the national team uh, heading into the World Cup. Uh, so, Mike, I'm going to throw it to you uh, in terms of the first one that we picked out here. Sort of walk us through it, uh, and then I've got – I think Jeff and I got some thoughts on on sort of what's uh, up for offer. Yeah, I know. I actually love this one, and um, yeah. I think their sports interaction is doing a really good job of leaning into some 
I guess, bets that other sports books are not going to have. So this bet's actually called Canada 2022 versus Canada 1986. Okay. And the bet is, will Canada concede less, more, or exactly the same amount of goals that Canada did at the 1986 World Cup? And for context, Canada conceded five goals at that World Cup. So if you're going to bet more goals, Canada conceding more goals, obviously they have Belgium and Croatia and Morocco who are all capable of finding the back of the net. Um, those are plus 237 odds. And less plus 262, exactly the same. You're looking at plus 325. So what do you guys say? Mike, I'll throw it to you first. Ooh, what do you say? Uh, Less, more, tough. or exactly the same? It's tough because you got a heart and head kind of. Yo, here. this is the ultimate it's heart the and head. Ultimate part, heart and head. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm actually going to go with exactly the same. Uh, I think five is, I think you can conceive five and not actually jeopardize your position and potentially qualifying. Oh, the easily. Round. Easily. Um, so yeah. I think I think defensively Canada can be locked in, um, you know, especially especially going into the Morocco game, but even maybe the Croatia game as well. Belgium will be interesting um, as they won't have, it doesn't look like they'll have Romelu Lukaku available for the first game um, against Canada. So I'm going to go, yeah, so I'm going to go with exactly the same. So I'm going to go with five goals conceded by Canada. Yeah, before I throw mm -hmm. it to you, Jeff, just, just quickly, mm -hmm. context-wise, um, Canada faced the USSR and lost 2-0. They faced... France, France and lost one nil, and then they mm -hmm. faced Hungary and lost two nil. But they did have a red card in that game as well. So actually, yeah, honestly, they, they did pretty men. well uh, in that yeah. tournament, just keeping it to, to yeah. five goals. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I mean, exactly the same to me is the cheap bet, right? That's the that's the ah, uh, and and I think the numbers reflect that. I'm actually going to say more, and I still think we might get out of our group. This isn't a knock on the on the Canadian men's national team in any way, shape and form. Some of these matches may be goal fests. Uh, you know, that, you know, it, we may win a match four three and, and, and throw it right out of uh, right out. And, and as Nathan's saying, you know, he's concerned about our defense on set pieces. That's a valid mm -hmm. concern. Right. Um, so yeah, not, 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 not to besmirch a Canadian men's national team, but you know, Ooh, the, the 1986 men's team were pretty defensively minded and they conceded five goals. They didn't score any goals, but they conceded five. I think our attack minded team might be down for a little bit more conceded goals in the group I love stage. the confidence. Four, three games. Are you kidding me? If we're in a four, three game and we don't get out of the group, um, um, I will actually be kind of shocked. I won't lie. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, five to me, it just, it seems a little, a little less. You know, maybe it's six and I come and I take all the money, but I'm, I'm going for more. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one, because obviously, like I already mentioned this, the weakest point on Canada's roster is their back line. But at the yep. same time, during qualifying, Canada's back line was so good. Unbelievably good. They yeah, did so well. And against teams like Mexico and the US, who I equate to like a Morocco. Right. So that being said, uh, I think uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be hot take. Let's, I'm gonna say less. I'm gonna say less. Yeah, I knew you were. I knew you were. Plus two sixty two. Let's okay. go. Less, take less, less, I think they'll have uh, four or under, and a plus two sixty two. That's actually not not terrible odds. So we'll see what happens, and they would yeah. need a pretty heroic performance to keep my bet intact against going up against guys like. Uh, Belgium, Croatia, and Morocco. So let's see what happens. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, my uh, just just crunching the numbers, which is not something I want to do ever. But you know, this is like a this, why wouldn't you say more? I mean, it's like the Price is Right bet, right? Like it's one it's one dollar. So yeah, I, I applaud both of your bravery, and it looks like I'm going for the safe bet, even though I just derided uh, <laughs> our man our man Mikey Newell for choosing the uh, the the C option on the 
on the multiple choice test. Hey, man. So, you know, sometimes with your heart in your head, you got to play it safe, you know? Yep, uh, yep, want sometimes. Some, want to keep, you, wanna keep the, some of those dollars in the pocket. <laughs> uh, so just just uh, uh, any uh, opinion expressed is not advice and a promise or suggestion that increases the chance of winning. Gambling can be addictive. Uh, please play responsibly. Learn more. Visit uh, www.sportinteraction.com slash HC. Or if you have any concerns about a gambling problem, call Connex Ontario at 1-866-531-2600. Ontario only. Must be 19 plus in order to play. Um, all right, the boys. dulcet uh, tones of Mike Newell. I love it. I love know, it, man. Gotta, you got to voice for radio, you know, buddy. Make sure that, uh, make sure that we're, we're taking care of everybody out there. Um, all right. Yep. So moving all, right along here. Um, we do have to talk about a little TFC. I mean, like, hey, the World Cup's going on, but Toronto FC is still the center of the universe. Um, so <laughs> it's Herbsa. <laughs> it's Herbsa. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna yeah. to get in the comments. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just a, a couple of quick TFC tidbits um, as the offseason sort of rolls along here. We're starting to get into MLS silly season. Um, nice and alliterative TFC tidbits. I like that. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to yeah, co yeah. coin that. That's going to be a new segment. Yeah. Um, uh, Luca Petrasso. Uh, traded to or the uh, Orlando City. I was, but I was about to say the Orlando Magic because I've been thinking about Pablo <laughs> the whole time, um, and I've just been thinking about how yeah. he's been balling out in the NBA. But no, to Orlando oh, yeah. City uh, for three uh, three hundred thousand of immediate gam plus another hundred grand in future tam over the next, I think, two seasons. Um, mm -hmm. So just a quick reaction from you guys in terms of the trade. Do you like it? Do you not like it? You know, do you think we got what we needed? Uh, for this particular deal? Uh, I'll go first because I know Mike's going to give an informed opinion and mine's just hot take knee slaps. But yeah, at first I was upset because, you know, we like the guy. But uh, like I was saying on a space as I did with Dwayne Wallens last week, um, this is the Academy producing. There are only so many first team spots on any team's roster. You know, this has to be seen as a win. Obviously, you know, we would love if Orlando City would take the DeAndre Kerr's or the Noble Akello's off Whoa. our hands, but that's not how I'm not here for the because, DeAndre Kerr's but land. That, but that's not how the world works, right? Luca showed well in limited minutes in, in an unforgivable context. And of course he's going to be trade bait. We were discussing this on, on this very show. Um, you know, you can't not see this as a win. Uh, one, this may be the maximum we would ever get for Luca. Uh, in terms of in terms of the outlay of cost from Orlando City, two, I keep coming back to it. Your academy produces when players get moved to other clubs, not necessarily the first team. It's the same sort of thing as producing. Um, it's never a linear path. The expectation that it was going to be and that every academy kid would end up on the first team is myopic in the extreme. Uh, sad to see him go, but you know, at the end of the day, you see it with max interview when he came back you see it with uh uh I, I i've lost my train of thought but this club uh you know your first club and the club that you came up through the academy remains a part of you so so uh you know we I, am i going to eliminate the the possibility that luca comes back after he's seasoned himself a little bit more in and around mls absolutely not uh i think this is the right move for the club and the player at the time uh and i applaud the move all right, Mikey, thoughts? I hate this move. Um, <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, value right. wise, value wise, they got a fair amount, like three hundred to four hundred k. They probably did well um, from a value perspective, just based on what Luke has shown. But this was a guy who, in my opinion, was not good enough to make it overseas but was good enough to be a very good MLS depth piece. Hmm. And you had that at a minimum contract on your team hmm. at a position where you don't have very many players. Um, he That's showed true. over, over the course of this year that he is ready and capable of stepping into major league soccer and being at very least a replacement level player and he's also shown that he's versatile can play either up the wing or he can play at fullback um 
he was a guy that the academy developed and grew and, and graduated from TFC two, put in such a grind and finally cracked through to the first team. Um, he was an epitome of what a good story should be for hmm. a club like Toronto FC. And the fact that they, they sold him after one year. And I, I, I'll go as far as saying he was probably maybe aside from Jaden Nelson, probably our best young player uh, hmm. last season. So the, to move on from him, uh, I didn't. I I didn't love it. Uh, but it has to be. Has to be something means that there's something else in the works. Uh, yeah, I think I think we can yeah. all agree on that. Right. There has yeah, to be I, I, I'm going to reserve a bit of judgment until I see what that is. Um, yeah, I, that's I, fair. I, I will. I will agree. I'm a little puzzled on the move just simply because of the depth at that left back position. I, I again, a, unless it's going to address something massive in the team and you have what you think are going to be ready-made solutions that are going to be able to step in right away and contribute right away. Now, of course, we don't know Fair. the status of D Domenico Crescito at this point. I know, Mike, you've reported nope. that he might be leaning towards retirement at this point. Um, but until we kind of have an idea of what that is, technically he's a Toronto FC player. And until he tells us he's fully retired, um, you know, he, he's still going to be penciled in as a starting left back. Um, so from that perspective, I, I kind of get that, but at the same time, you need depth. This team badly, badly needs depth and ha it has to do a lot of work in this off season to get that depth. And I just yeah. don't think trading off somebody, you are a devil, you know, to maybe get a devil. You don't. I'm not sure about that, but let's see where that gam goes, right? Like if that go gam goes yeah. to assuring Jonathan Osorio stays or gets you a starting goalkeeper, okay, maybe you can kind of justify it, but let's see where that money goes. But right now it's a little puzzling, to be honest. Yeah, I rate I Luca, and maybe that's just because I rate him pretty pretty highly maybe higher than other people do um, no i think but... a lot of people do right like i i think he i think you're right in the sense that he probably for, at least for the first half of the season was probably the young player that was the most impressive oh yeah uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. all of us were singing his praises absolutely absolutely right so it's, it's in the same context shocking. that's 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 the player that that other scouts around the league identified as a as an as somebody to acquire so you know uh it works both ways right and uh you have to hope. I mean, that's the caveat here, which I think you, you expressed pretty eloquently. You have to hope there's something in the works here. Because if it was just a move for a move's sake, uh, I don't understand it either. But in terms of this this idea that, you know, the only path from the academy is uh, uh, to the first team or nothing, and that's how you quantify a successful academy, I do take issue with that. that you know, uh, being able to sell players interleague from your academy uh, how can that not be a successful academy, right? No, no, I think player. there is success yeah. in that. A lot of clubs around the world use their academies essentially as ways to replenish mm -hmm. the transfer funds, right? Like that's yep. not yep. unheard of from clubs around the world. But I would argue that when you find somebody in your academy that actually does properly no, I agree with you. Yeah. that you need, you may want to hang around to them because who knows, right? If if Luca played minutes, you might increase his value. You may get more than 400000 for him if he but, plays significant minutes this season, but we won't know, right? Uh, well, we'll know if he plays for Orlando, right? We will see how they build mm -hmm. their squad. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. And that's, it's, it's also like maybe Luca wanted more minutes. Maybe that was part maybe. of the equation, right? Maybe he wanted a new opportunity. So there are other layers to, to this move in particular. Um, but what I'll add and I'll throw it out there, there Luca won't be the last young guy to leave Toronto FC this offseason. Yeah, I expect more. I, I expect more. I absolutely do. So, and, and there'll be and there'll be guys that hurt because they showed better than most in the great player kids experiment. And that's that's just par for the course, right? Like we're, we're you know, trade bait is trade bait is trade bait. So it is going to be the guys that uh, you know we have a certain affinity to that are going to be going out the door, as opposed to guys that you know di were a disappointment that now uh, we're ho we're holding on to uh, by virtue of no one else wants them. So yeah, I I, I agree with you. I, I think we'll see more. I just find it interesting now that so many people who were kind of jumping on the hey get rid of all the kids the the kids suck 
now are all like, why are we getting rid of Luke? Why did we lose that kid? Like, get rid of the kids. No, not that one. Not that one. Right? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, Mm -hmm. it's it's just an interesting time right now at TFC. So we'll we'll see how that. I mean, uh, I mean, Mike says it best. You know, the story of of our lack of outside backs uh, is not a new thing. So, you know, in this situation, especially getting rid of a capable understudy that can play outside back does seem like we're taking crazy pills because of the the need in that position and the lack of depth that we still are suffering from. And also the the gray region around, will Crescido be back? Will, will, be, will we be able to get it over the line with Nottingham Forest with Richie, you know? Uh, uh, if we end up in the same situation we were at the beginning of last season and we don't even have a Luca Petrasso, that's when this move starts to get really, really cringy. And and so I, I do I do I do agree with uh with with uh with our with our esteemed co host here with respect to how this move doesn't necessarily feel right. But yeah, let's hope I, they got something cooking. Well, I mean, a lot of people are pointing to to Themi and Tagalu, right, as as a potential mm. backup. But then again, you're just in the same position you were in last year with a player who hasn't played a ton of senior minutes, potentially playing that role, right? Like, I again, it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, what what's the you know, like where where yeah, like, what's where the end game here? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love Themi too, and I was t- I've been tweeting out Themi and talking about him on the show for two three years. Um, mm, he sure has. I'm a fan. But he's not ready to slot in at left back in Major League Soccer. Um, wow. So it's really good glimpses of some brilliance. Never, never, Yvonne, never. Oh, oh, I can't but, even look at it. I can't even look at the comment. Never. No, no, no. <laughs> but yeah, Themi, uh, I don't think Themi's ready to step into that role. I think, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, last yeah. thing on the TFC train here is um, I, it just interesting. Obviously, an article coming out in England um, in the Mirror, which again, take that for a grain of salt. It is the Mirror in the UK, mm-hmm. but basically saying that Jonathan Osorio is interested in a move to England, specifically the Championship, um, and and trying to apply his wares in uh, in Europe. Now uh, we have you know, report on this show and it's been reported that Jonathan Soria has a new agent. Um, Mm -hmm. He is in, he specializes in sort of getting players to England um, from that perspective, but he's open to other moves um, in in Europe as well. I know he's, it was reported that he could have gone to um, one of, one of the clubs in the Greek super league um, in January, if he so chose. So, uh, but that's not really, that is what I'm interested in. It's more the sort of reaction to this, which I've, it's been interesting because I've seen a lot of people just kind of be angry about it. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and I'm just, it's an interesting reaction. Uh, and I wanted to get your guys' take on this because I, I, I kind of find it interesting that people are kind of upset that Oso would want to go to Europe. It's like he's been talking about this for a while, so I don't know why people are for a upset. long time. Yeah, I don't I don't know why they're upset either. I mean, it sucks, but it you know, you do not impugn the desire of a player, especially someone who's been such a good servant to this club. Uh, if, if, if the fates align and, and Oso gets to make his, his dream move, you don't stand in his way. That's a horrible position for the club to take. Uh, it's going to hurt. Uh, I don't think that's, that's, uh, I don't think that's a surprise. So yeah, I mean, I, I, people can be angry, but it, 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 people are going to be angry about lots of weird things. This is just another thing that people can be angry about that i don't understand uh you know the older i get the more i find that that happens <laughs> yeah I, I spoke about this a lot on on room 442 today um so i won't dive into it too much but what i'll say is if jonathan Osorio is coming back to toronto fc it's going to cost toronto fc a lot more than they want to pay um listen it's not a secret i've been reporting this story the entire year I spoke mm-hmm. to Oza multiple times. He's been stri- very straightforward and straight up about um, his desires, which is the fact that it's his last big contract that he's going to sign. Mm-hmm. He needs to make the best decision for him. You only can play so long and make so much money as a footballer. So if it's not Champions League, it's going to be a very high league in, in Europe that he's going to get- seek after. And if not, then he's going to take the best offer, probably financially, 
uh, that makes sense for for him and his family. Yep, and that's fair. Can't fault the man. It's yeah, fair. Can't fault him. And yeah, it's it, completely mm-hmm. fair. It's, yeah, it, that, yeah, it's right? completely fair. So uh, yeah. just everybody, calm down. Okay, <laughs> like, he, you know, <laughs> okay, he, he, uh, you, you never know, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe they do give him the DP slot. Uh-huh. Um, you never know. But uh, yeah. okay, so we'll go into burning questions here before we wrap up uh, today's show. Um, so, uh, I said, put a pin in the dual national conversation earlier in the show. Let's unpin that and let's talk about it a little bit. Uh, question from John Borg, just was there, e- was there ever any consideration to calling up uh, a good dual national to entice them to choose Canada? I know Mike, you were going into that a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. it, just from a fact, do we know that there was a possibility of a Daniel Jebison or a Colio show to say like, Hey, you know, maybe we'll give you that 25th or 26th spot to, to if you sort of commit to the program. Well, I believe both players are probably on John Herman's short list. And when you say short, it's like a 40 something person yeah, yeah, yeah. list. Mm-hmm. Right. And I know uh, Herman would have probably loved to throw a guy like Daniel Jebison on the list. However, it, it, it ultimately is up to Jebison. I know Jebison actually probably wasn't fit uh, to be thrown onto that list, anyways. Um, so was there consideration? Yeah, there probably was. Was it realistic at any point? Probably not. And what we've learned about John Herman over this whole stretch, this whole cycle is that he's a very, very loyal guy, Mm -hmm. right? He tends to stick with the people that got him here. And I think people who are on this team earn this spot. And I think that actually means a lot to all 26, 27. If you include Daniil guys who are in Qatar, uh, they want to, build the brand brotherhood and they want to really play on that fact. Well, actions have to speak louder than words when it comes down to that. And that's exactly what John Herman did by picking his squad and picking his roster. So yeah, to answer your question, I don't think anything, anything realistic. Yeah. It's so cynical. This is a world cup. This isn't a participation badge. Like I understand that we're coming at a disadvantage and I understand that we want to cap tie these guys and I understand that we want to build for the future and all of that faff. But this is a World Cup. This is the premier event in the sport that we love. You don't give free rides. Uh, it should, you know, I'm not saying that everything is based on. Well, I am. I, I mean, form and 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 personality are merit, right? Like you can argue if Daniil had come, you know, it wasn't on form. It was, but it's still on merit. There are other things he brings to the table that maybe you know supersede this something as 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 ephemeral as form. Um, I didn't. I don't like it. There are plenty of carrots to dangle uh, to dual nationals that isn't a spot in a roster for the premier sporting event in our sport, potentially in all sports. Uh, you know, I I just don't. I don't see Herdman as the kind of guy that plays that sort of game. You know, I I think he's well aware that there are that there are other there are intermediate level carrots to dangle. Um, I'm not, I don't even really want to get into what the public perception of something like that is. And I'm not, I'm not saying from Canada, I'm saying from other footballing nations, it, 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 it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. You know, there are other ways to attract players and, and using, using this as a carrot, I think is, is really, really cynical and it, and it does a disservice to what it means to be uh, a, a rostered world cup flair, you know, I, I just, again, uh, you know, th- it's a game of inches. It's, it, we're not talking about replacing Davies with, you know, the, the la- you know, the latest dual national. We're talking about one of the, one of the free spots on the list, uh, even though there aren't that many free spots on the list. And even then I still think it's a bad idea. I don't, I don't like what it communicates. I don't like it. It, it cheapens it to me. It cheapens, you know, the 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 roster spot in and of itself understanding of course these are players of quality but i i think there's other ways to to attract them to the canadian national side than 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 the nuclear option in this case fair enough okay um yeah agree they'll have their time there will be opportunities to to take them uh to other competitions um nations league gold cups um, yeah, yeah. You know, there, there, there'll be an opportunity there. Um, okay, uh, so going on to a TFC question from TFC uh, NU2. Uh, should we expect those age restric- age restricted spots, meaning supplemental spots on the TFC roster, to go to TFC2 players, or will we see more signings from the NCAA slash CanPL like DeAndre Kerr or Caden Chung? 
Um, so uh, just for context, hmm. it looks like there's three supplemental spots now open on the TFC roster. Um, so I guess the question here is, you know, how does TFC go about filling those roster spots? Are they going to sort of pull up from the Academy in TFC two or start to maybe look at the can PL to fill some of those roles? And I'm assuming there's a little like bringing Marco Bustos into camp, things like that. He's too, isn't he too old to, to, I mean, I, uh, this is, I don't know. Conversation I, I don't, I, yeah. With TFC. I mean, it's, uh, it's MLS yeah, roster, yeah. Those, man. Don't ask. Yeah, me. yeah. 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 I mean, the suggestion is he's too old to qualify for, for any of that roster relief. Uh, I, you know, without uh, re taking opera glasses to the documentation, I, I can't confirm or deny that, but I do think there's, there's a certain logic in that. Um, you know, before I, we seed it to Mike, obviously Bob Bradley has said that there's no mechanism that will go un unused, uh, in this, in this off season. So you'd have to assume they're going to go for every possible opportunity and, and, and hopefully the scouting department's up to snuff and have, have, have got dossiers on, on, uh, U sports players have dossiers on CPL players and have dossiers on on MLS players even into the academy and next squads of, of other MLS teams so that they can do this right. Yeah, uh, it, you're right, Jeff. It's going to be a combination of everything. There's no one correct answer to this. One thing I will say and I'll give is that I fully do expect by the end of this off season that Kobe Franklin is a first team Toronto FC player. Wow! So there goes. I thought that was one of last year, frankly. There goes one. Yeah, of so did spots. I actually. Yeah, so did yeah. So did Kobe. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So that I I fully expect that to happen. He's a guy who's rated extremely highly. Uh, had a fantastic year with TFC too, and I'm sure is a guy that TFC do not want to lose. So um, that that's one thing I would expect. But yeah, yeah, I think you're right, Jeff. A little bit of everything uh, to sort of round yeah. out the roster, and hopefully it's not players. That no offense to the players, but hopefully it's not players that we see too often uh, put on the TFC shirt and be in the 11. Because yeah, uh, yeah. we tried that. That didn't go so well last We tried time. that. Yeah, it didn't go <laughs> so well. <laughs> yeah, it didn't work out so well. Uh, <laughs> no, all no, right. No. Uh, yeah, let's wrap it up there, gents. Uh, there, is, there is a third burning question, but a lot of you were asking about our thoughts and predictions for Canada in the World Cup. We're going to save that for next week for the Monday show. Uh, that's yeah, yeah, we got Taskmasters. Show. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's the, <laughs> that's the last show before uh, Canada's first game uh, against Belgium, so we'll definitely get into that um, on that show. But thank you for listening to another episode of Toronto Till I Die. We will be back next week, like I said, with two shows, so more, more eyeballs, more in your holes for the next couple of weeks um so we love it we're still aiming to get our follows up on twitter um uh, just for the world cup so gotta get that blue check guys yeah gotta, gotta get give us a follow check, at, yeah. at toronto till i die <laughs> um and our sister <laughs> life reaction show um the tunnel mm -hmm. club uh the handle is at tfc tunnel club mike sorry you wanted to jump in there yeah just quickly once again uh just a reminder uh youtube make sure you guys follow yes. us on our new youtube channel uh we will no longer be doing shows from homestand sports it'll be on our toronto till i die youtube channel so please go subscribe to that channel uh so you don't miss a show and we appreciate all of your support i see 12 people have already jumped in and subscribed so you guys are real ones we appreciate you mm -hmm. so much you're uh, in our starting 11 less that. one of you yes well, yeah, first yeah, we'll, we'll one of you doesn't one. get we'll yeah, yeah, one. We'll, yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll get you first <laughs> off the bench um speaking of the tunnel club really quick um sean and i will be back uh with new episodes during the world cup run as well doing Love either pre-games or post-game reaction shows we actually have a new episode we did one yesterday on the so World good. Cup roster announcement. Thank you, Jeffrey. I saw you on there. Um, so have us uh, give us a listen on the podcast form, which is on the Toronto Till I Die web uh, pod stream. So wherever you get your podcast, you'll we'll find it there. Mm -hmm. uh, your podcatchers, exactly. Um, or you can, if you want to listen to live raw audio of me stumbling uh, during the opening, uh, Sean was having technical difficulties. Uh, feel free to part. listen. I know, but uh, feel free to listen <laughs> to that on the uh, on our. Uh, Twitter stream. So just uh, go over to at TFC Tunnel Club. It is pinned at the top of our profile page. Um, but other than that, uh, for Jeffrey P. Nesker and for Michael Singh, thank you uh, for listening and we will see you next week. World Cup week. Get ready. Love it. Well, Unbelievable. Guys. So excited. And wait, and wait, and baby, I'm TFC till I die.